Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ on this beautiful August morning. Someone said, this is the hottest uh, Sunday of the summer, and I said, hopefully. <laughs> and welcome to those of you who um, chose the better path, perhaps, I should say, and uh, are home worshiping. In, uh, in front of a, uh, your own personal fan or air conditioner. Uh, welcome to everyone. We will be gathering at the table this morning for Holy Communion. And for those of you who are worshiping with us uh, in person, we have prepared little packets that will be handed out to you at the appropriate time. We do have uh, gluten-free packets available also. And uh, for those of you who are worshiping at home, uh, we invite you to prepare your table with loaf and cup and join us at this life-giving meal. We welcome today the Reverend Alexis Fuller Wright, our designated term associate conference minister. Uh, she will be preaching today and be around to uh, uh, share a little conversation after worship um, about some things that are happening in the conference uh, not the least of which is that we have a new uh, conference minister elect. Yesterday in Brunswick, the conference voted overwhelmingly to call the Reverend Dr. Marisa Laviola as our next settled conference minister. She will begin her ministry among us in October. 
uh, at the end of October. And uh, so we will uh, look forward to welcoming her to Maine. She's coming from the Penn Central Conference where she has been serving as an Associate Conference Minister. We, so we will be having a time of refreshment and fellowship following worship today and invite you all to stick around for that and a little bit of conversation. Are there other announcements that should be shared this morning? Mike Effenberger is away today. The Soggy Po Boys are up in Burlington, Vermont, and uh, uh, there was probably a 15-minute window that he couldn't uh, be here and there at the same time. Uh, but uh, we welcome Alan Robinson to our piano bench this morning. So thank you. Alan. Let us continue in our worship. to community is printed in our bulletins. Let us read responsively. Make a joyful sound to the Holy One. Let the earth rejoice. How awesome are your works, creating God. Creation groans under the pressure of war, environmental abuse, and communal disconnection. We cry out to you, Prayer of God. And you hear and respond. You turn our mourning into movement and stir our souls to action and to rest. Renewing God, we will give you thanks and praise you, for you clothe us in joy and peace. Our opening <laughs> hymn is number 392, Draw Us in the Spirit's Tether, and the words are on the back of your bulletin. Thank you.
us pray our gathering prayer. God with us, you send us into the world as your agents of restoration and change. You speak to us in the stillness of our rest and in the chaos of a frenzied world. You guide us in in-between times and move us forward in gratitude and hopefulness. We give thanks for your presence among us. Open all points of receptivity within us as we worship you, holy and living God. Amen. As a bird. Flee as a bird. Beautiful. Our prayer for illumination is printed in our bulletins. Let us pray together. Spirit of the living God, turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts by the word we now declare and ponder. In ancient pages, let us find fresh life, fresh hope, and fresh courage for witness in your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first reading this morning is uh, a contemporary reading. It is from a book of devotions, blessings by John O'Donohue. I have shared some of these over the past couple of years during our time of separation. Uh, so the book is called To Bless the Space Between Us. Uh, it was written in 2008 uh, without any inkling, I'm sure, of, of what we have been through over the last 30 months. Um, but it speaks profoundly to where we are 
um, and where we are in many, many times and places in our lives. So this reading um, blessing is called For the Interim Time. When near the end of day, life has drained out of light, and it is too soon for the mind of night to have darkened things, no place looks like itself. Loss of outline makes everything look strangely in between, unsure of what has been or what might come. In this wan light, even trees seem groundless. In a while, it will be night, but nothing here seems to believe the relief of dark. You are in this time of the interim, where everything seems withheld. The path you took to get here has washed out. The way forward is still concealed from you. The old is not old enough to have died away. The new is still too young to be born. You cannot lay claim to anything. In this place of dark, your eyes are blurred and there is no mirror. Everyone else has lost sight of your heart and you can see nowhere to put your trust. You know you have to make your own way through. As far as you can, hold your confidence. Do not allow your confusion to squander this call which is loosening your roots in false ground that you might come free from all that you have outgrown. What is being transfigured here is your mind, and it is difficult and slow to become new. The more faithfully you can endure here, the more refined your heart will become for your arrival in the new dawn. One of the things I should have clarified when I um, spoke to Brad in preparation for today is who reads the scripture? Because I visit all sorts of congregations um, and typically it's been the liturgist. So I don't actually have a Bible or copy of the scripture with me. <laughs> we can fix that. I need to memorize the Catch me. <laughs> Catch me empty handed this morning. Well, while he gets that scripture for me, I want to start by just saying good morning and welcome on behalf of the main conference and the 150 additional churches that make it up. I bring you greetings. I also bring you greetings from our newly elected, newly um, voted on uh, conference minister, Marisa Laviola. She is very much looking forward to coming and visiting you as well someday. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> details, details. Details, details. <laughs> <laughs> um, but truly, it, has been a, it is a joy to be here when Brad uh, and I were talking about dates. I was so grateful that we could make it work the morning after the vote because when you are the lead on a search committee, that is like your Super Bowl when they vote in the new conference minister. So I am grateful he can just take a deep breath this morning um, and that we have a chance to connect with you all. Um, thank you for sharing Brad with us. I know he has put so much work, so much care into this effort on behalf of the conference and it has been so deeply appreciated. So I invite you now um, to hear the story of the call of the first disciples. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun land of Naphtali, the 
the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him, and he went from there and saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. May God bless these words in our own mind as we think through how they might speak to us today. Would you be with me in the spirit of prayer? Speak to us, God, for we are listening. Speak to us, God, for we are waiting for your voice. Speak to us now in our hearts and all around us. Tell us what will be what will be. Amen. Amen. Not long ago, I heard a speech that was being given by a political activist where she shared a little bit about her call to the political life. And she says that the life of politics was actually never part of her plan. And in fact, as she described it, she had no plan. It all started one day when she was waitressing. She was on a coffee break and found herself scrolling through Facebook. And she saw pictures of an old friend who had traveled out to Standing Rock and was advocating out there with the people. So she reached out to her friend and said, I would love to support you in your work out there in Standing Rock. What do you need? Do you need food? Do you need supplies? Do you need clothing? We need women, responded the friend. When can you get here? <laughs> Come to Standing Rock? She wasn't really sure how she was going to do that. Among other things, she didn't own a car. She had never been to South Dakota. She said, I thought I was going to send some coats. <laughs> and instead, they were asking for my body. The invitation scared her. And she didn't answer right away, but the thought just wouldn't let her alone. And later she was talking to another friend of hers, and she shared with her that she couldn't quite shake the idea of going out to Standing Rock. And the friend admitted to her that she had also been feeling this call to go out there. And so they decided, let's just go for it. They had no plan. They had no resources. They just had this call that would not let them alone. And then, as so often happens when we step out in faith, the resources started to appear as they needed them. Her friend's aunt had a car that they could borrow, a 1998 Subaru that had no heat. It didn't even have one of those little cigarette lighters where you could plug in uh, something to charge your phone, but it got them there. They fundraised for gas on Facebook. They're, they had friends in states along the way that offered up their, their couches for, uh, for them to stay on overnight. And the friends would say, so what's your plan once you get there? Plan? We don't have a plan. There was no plan. There was just this recognition that it was the right thing to do. It was a commitment that they had to, and they wanted to follow where that led. 
And so it is that they arrived in Standing Rock to help defend and protect sacred land. And this woman said it was one of the most sacred experiences she had ever had. Being there changed her and prepared her, but she didn't know for what. So as she left, she prayed, Lord, do with me what you will. Make me a vessel. And so on the way home, she gets an email asking her to run for Congress. <laughs> it felt like the right next thing, she said, but she also knew it was incredibly unlikely that she would win against the incumbent. So she decided if she was going to do this, she would have to redefine for herself what winning looked like. And so she, be she became clear. If she could organize her community, get them educated about the issues that were affecting them, and invested in the well-being of their neighbors in the course of her campaign, then for her, that would be winning. That was the goal. Well, it turned out that her commitment to the well-being of her neighbors was more compelling for her community than the status quo, and she did get elected. So once again, people said, what's your plan? <laughs> and once again, she did not have one. She was waiting from God to hear what the plan should be. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the Congresswoman from New York's 14th district, did not have a plan, but she had a commitment. A commitment to a flourishing world a commitment to human dignity, a commitment to the question of why some people matter and others fall through the cracks. Ocasio-Cortez's job, as she understands it, is not to come up with a five-year plan or a ten-year plan or to figure out the seven easy steps to re-election. It is to be clear about the principles she is committed to and then to follow where they lead. Peter, Andrew, James, and John were not waiting tables in the Bronx, but they were doing the first century equivalent. Fishermen were low caste people in ancient Judea, and these first disciples provided unglamorous, menial labor that were subjected to huge amounts of taxation from the government. And that the best thing that a fisherman had going for it was that the work was known. It was comfortable. It is what their families had always done. And for a lot of us, especially for those of us who hate change, the known is quite compelling. But when the invitation came to leave the known and help Jesus usher in a whole new way of living, economically and socially, they did not hesitate. According to the text, Matthew says they immediately dropped their nets. They were so captivated by Jesus and his message that they could not help but follow. But my guess is that these first disciples had no idea what they were signing up for. My bet is that there was no plan on their part, no sense of how this whole thing was gonna shake out. Just a deep knowing that somehow this was the right next thing. You know, so often in life, we want to know, how is this all going to work out? Where is this going to lead? What is the plan? We yearn for someone to hand us the answers. I mean, the reason the self-help industry has exploded over the last decade is because there is nothing more seductive than someone promising to make the pain stop in seven easy steps. And each week in conference ministry, I speak with different church leaders and volunteers and pastors, and everyone seems to be looking for the same kinds of answers. Will the rest of our membership ever return? How can we move forward when our volunteers are so exhausted? Can we recapture the sense of community that we've lost over the last couple of years? 
How can we find normalcy when things are constantly changing? Will the church survive this? What are the books, podcasts, speakers who can help us figure out where it is that we are going? As Father John O'Donohue wrote in his Blessing for the Interim Time, you are in a time of interim where everything seems withheld. The path you took to get here was washed out. The way forward is still concealed to you. The old is not old enough to have died away. The new, still too young to be born. And of course, it's not just the church that is existing in this purgatory space. We are in a time of massive social upheaval. Every institution from the church to healthcare to academia to democracy itself is being pressure tested. And it's not clear what elements of these societal bedrocks will continue to exist in the years to come. Everyone is looking around and asking, what should we do? How do we fix things? But it turns out, beloved, that that is the wrong question. The question isn't, what is your plan? The question is, what are we committed to? Or perhaps as people of faith, an even better question is, who are we committed to following? Our job isn't to come up with a five-year plan or a 10-year plan or to figure out the seven easy steps to the future of the church. It is to be clear about the principles that we are committed to and then to follow where they lead. One of the very best examples I've seen of this is in the creation of Sunday School. Raise your hand if you know how it is that the church came to offer Sunday school. Do you know? You told me last week. <laughs> <laughs> it was a product of the Industrial Revolution. So children used to live in an agrarian society, and they would go to church with their families. They would work the fields most of the day, but they'd also go to school, right? And when the Industrial Revolution started, they, the children as young as six and seven began working in factories six days a week, sometimes 12 hours a day, right? This is before the advent of labor laws. Thank you, church, also, for being active in advocating for fairer and juster, just practices around labor laws. But the, the women of the church looked around, and they saw this epidemic of illiteracy happening in their churches. They were so worried that the children weren't going to learn how to read and that they were going to be caught in this cycle. And they said, well, we have access to them on Sunday mornings, and we have the Bible. So they took what they had and began to teach children to read using Bible stories. And it wasn't that the children needed to learn the Bible stories because they were already sitting in church with their parents. So they were learning them just as their family was learning. But they needed to, to have other skills to be able to operate in the world. And that's how the trend caught on. That's how the Christian education movement was born. You know, so often I hear people lament Sunday morning sports is the reason that families don't come to church anymore. But Sunday morning sports is just a symptom. It's not the cause. What made Sunday school powerful wasn't that children were getting taught Bible stories. They were, as I said, they were already learning it. What made it powerful was that the church found a way to make sure that the kids in their community didn't fall through the cracks. My guess is that 100 years ago, no church across the country ever imagined that Sunday school was going to become a staple of church life. They just thought they were doing the next right thing to follow Jesus in their place and in their time. And now it seems that the structures that evolved to meet a very real need are crumbling 
for a lot of churches. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that just means that right now the most powerful thing that we can do is ask, what are the challenges that our community are facing today? Who is falling between the cracks? And what resources do we already have to meet those needs? I wish I had a magic ball to give you the answers to those questions, but I don't. However, my guess is that if the church keeps doing the next right thing, that they will land somewhere close to where Jesus was. And that maybe they might even find the next transforming mission of their church in the meantime. Because Jesus' call isn't to preserve what has been. His call is to release our attachment to the things that feel safe and known and follow. Notice that Jesus doesn't say to the disciples, balance your budget and follow me. Or put together an action plan and follow me. Or even, hey guys, just pay attention and when the conditions are right, when it feels like it's safe, follow me. No, he just says, follow. And it's not that those things don't matter. It's that those things aren't the heart of the call. Walking with Jesus is the heart of the call. When we walk the path that Jesus walked and commit to the values and to the priorities that he embodied, the next steps appear. Maybe only one at a time, but they will come. My favorite cross-country coach used to say, if you can only take one step, just take one step. At the end of his blessing for the interim time, John O'Donohue writes this. What is being transfigured is your mind. And it is difficult and slow to become new. The more faithfully you can endure here, the more refined your heart will become for your arrival in the new dawn. Beloved church, this pandemic has created a number of challenges in congregations, not just here at Kittery, not just in Maine, but across the country, across the world. But it has also come with the invitation to rethink what it means to follow Jesus today. Yes, the path feels unclear, and there is, an, there is a lot in our world that feels like death. But here's the good news. We are resurrection people. Now that process might take three days, or three years, or three generations. The good, slow work of God cannot be rushed. But it also can't be stopped. Resurrection, my friends, it's what God does. It's who God is. God is the ultimate upcycler, making something new and beautiful out of the tattered pieces of the old. And not even the pandemic can stop that. So church, may we be willing to trust this sacred process that has brought us to this very moment and have the courage to follow God into an unknown future we don't need to have all the answers, but we do need to have the courage to follow Jesus down some unknown paths. <laughs> if the answer is yes, then chances are the next right thing will appear. May we all have the courage to take that first step. Amen. Amen. Amen.
As we gather before God uh, to worship in prayer, I invite you to lift up from the congregation names and situations that should be in our prayers this day and through this week. I have two joys. Joys, yes. Tom had a birthday last Friday. And then Happy birthday, Tom. Dennis Dean had a birthday, too. <laughs> We have two birthdays. Two birthdays. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Priscilla. We had a wonderful time Thursday night at the very hot, warm, hot <laughs> lot and roasting beer evening, but it was wonderful. Our fellowship at Hackmatack Playhouse and at the DeRochemonts, who were so generous in hosting us once again. We'll have to figure another reason to come out there for for a potluck. Well, Mike got, did whisper in my ear that something else might happen, but okay. he's not financing it. All right. <laughs> so we'll have to wait and see if something else comes up now. Yeah. Excellent. Lois. Uh, yesterday's events up in Brunswick were inspiring, uh, and I, I really am glad to see so, uh, Marissa Lavaiola uh, is a lovely, lovely woman, yes. and uh, I hope to see quite a bit more of this, but I thank God for sending her our way. Yes. Well, we will keep the main conference in our prayers and uh, give thanks for the Reverend Dr. Marisa Laviola, who is our conference minister-elect. and. Uh, for all of us as we enter this new chapter of all our life together. Oh. Uh, Kathy. Kathy. Yeah. We'll keep Jim in our prayers today, please. Samira. Samira. the victims of gun violence and and family in our prayers. Yes? Um, my former administrator, Carol, um, from when I served a church in Princeton, was just diagnosed with a very fast-acting form of cancer that has spread. And so they're starting chemo, um, but they still haven't decided whether the next step is going to be palliative or they think that there might be some quality of life they can extend. So prayers for Carol, for mercy for her, uh, and for those that love her. We keep Carol in our prayers. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for this day, even this day, day that makes us feel uncomfortable and seeking shade and refreshment. And we pray that this time together will give us shade and refreshment and strengthen us for the work that you have set before us. We celebrate this day the ministries of the main conference for our conference minister-elect Marisa Laviola, for the ministries of Alexis Fuller-Wright, our designated term associate conference minister, for, for all of the, uh, the staff and leadership of the main conference that, that we, 
we pray for them in this time of transition as we move into a more settled place. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate the long ministry of the Hackmatack Playhouse and for our involvement there over the years. We pray that a, a new thing might come along, the next right thing. We pray also on this day for Jim, for Kathy, for Carol and Samira. We pray for the family and friends of Bradley Williams and Bill Wheeler. We pray for the victims of flooding in Appalachia and wildfires out west. We pray for healing for our planet. We pray for victims of gun violence wherever they are. We lift up prayers for peace in Ukraine. We pray for the family of Valentina. We pray for people of Ethiopia, the drought and hunger that is spreading there. We pray for healing for our our, our nation, our world. For peace and justice in our world. We pray for ourselves. For the needs that we now lift up to you. Spoken or in silence. Hear all our prayers on this day, loving God, for we lift them up in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, O great Father, the one who lives above us all, your name is sacred and holy. Bring your good road to us, where the beauty of the world above is reflected in the earth below. Provide for us day by day the elk, the buffalo, the salmon, the corn, the squash, the wild rice, all those good things we need every day to feed our families. Release us from the things we have done wrong in the same way we release others for the things done wrong to us. Guide us away from selfish desire that tempts us to stray from your good road, and rescue us from that evil one and his worthless ways. Your good road, with its great power and beauty, shines like the sun to the time beyond the end of all days. Amen. We come now to the time in our worship when we are invited to respond. We have not yet gotten to the place where we will pass the plate around. Maybe that is coming. Maybe that is one of those things that we leave behind. There is a plate by the door. If you have a gift that you would like to leave in it uh, today, you are welcome to do that. For those of you who are worshiping online, we invite you to visit our website. If you feel a, um, an urge, a calling to support the ministries of Second Christian Church. But I do invite all of us on this day to think about what that next right thing might be. For us at Second Christian, for your life, uh, imagine what that one step might be that you are ready to take. And let's prepare ourselves to take that next step. Let us worship God with our tithes and our offerings.
our gifts. Creator, bless these gifts that we bring to this community and the world. May our time be used preciously, our treasure shared faithfully, and our talents demonstrated gloriously in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Today we have graduated from our little, what is it, cups, our manna that have brought us through the desert, and we are now, uh, moved, we have moved on to envelopes with real bread and a grape in them, and we will invite you to come forward and, um, and pick one up. We do, we have uh, regular bread in the basket and some gluten-free wafers. Um, in the bowl. So um, we will um, give you the high sign when it's time to come forward and everybody will be able to um, to pick up their communion elements. Christ's invitation is simple. Do not be afraid, little flock, even when there is much to fear. Find your treasure among God's children, that where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Light all the lamps of love. Open the door to those who knock and God will feed you. In the middle of the night, at dawn of day, and in this Sunday morning place now. Embrace what is unexpected in this hour at our own table. We remember the Creator fed the Aurora Borealis and the ocean depths. Pterodactyls and diatoms, all we see now that grows and breathes, all that swims, swarms, slithers, all that runs, flies, leaps, and loves. We remember Jesus played vintner at a wedding feast, told parables about finding hope. Comes from eating the pig's food, and finding community from taking the lowest place at the table. We remember a Passover in Jerusalem when Jesus chose bread and wine, common food that did not come from the death of an animal, to prepare for a day of facing the abuse of a tree, and explain that there is a God-shaped hole in everyone's belly, and it would be filled with love. As we bless this simple meal we share, let us once again taste and see that God is good. Let us pray. Let's, let, yeah, we'll invite you to come forward now um, and, and receive your, your envelope. So you want to take that one and I will 
Okay. bless this simple meal that we share. Let us once again taste and see that God is good. God of, God of feast and fast, birthday, birthday party and IV nutrition, who relishes falafel, jambalaya, pad thai, and celebrates with precious food chosen by those with allergies and sensitivities. Help us eat with compassion for the earth, delight in many flavors, and generosity in sharing. Praise to you, Lokabor, Foodie, Eucharist, present in this meal and as new life. Amen. The bread in your hand, the bread on your table is blessed and broken like the picnic of grace. Sharing love, we will never be hungry. In thanksgiving for this meal that heals yesterday, satisfies today, and empowers tomorrow, let us give thanks. Holy One, as we receive this sacrament, we think we eat a gourmet menu, only to discover we are to become your food trucks of love and justice, compassion and courage in every corner of every city for all of your children who need a meal of hope and healing. Thank you for the sustenance and the call. Amen. Our closing hymn is number, well, it's on the back of your bulletin. <laughs> it's ours, the journey.
service has ended, but our service in the world begins. So go out now to be the hands and feet of Christ, to listen for where the spirit, spirit stirs, <laughs> and to be brave enough to follow where it leads, taking each next step, following instructions for the next right thing. Go, and may the peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.